when I saw what you were proposing and what you offer to your clients, I was like, this is a smart guy because you just know how limited the capability set is to have one single asset, not know what to do with it or just have one aspect of an asset and not have the whole thing. Like you just probably started giving that thing and just stood on the sidelines. Like I did the same thing. I'd sit on the sidelines and go, great, right? You know what to do with that, right? And nope. And we go, well, maybe we'll do that for you. And then we go, holy crap, we have to become basically like a, an embedded resource. And I saw that you did that. And I thought this, and I don't mean reeks in a bad way, this reeks of a guy who has been listening, cares deeply about outcomes, not just staying in your little lane, not just yeah. doing what you're paid to do, like you were over the line and then decided to get paid for it. But if you're working with those small businesses, I did too. And until they let go and really accept who they are, you know, they, they hang on to weird stuff. But, but having someone like you come in and do what you're doing and just basically be the friend they never had, somebody that's thinking critically on their behalf, like it's an indispensable value. They just don't find people like vendors don't do that. Vendors are standing on the side of the pool going, well, I gave you a life preserver. What's your problem? Hey, I'm Armando Leduc, producer, film actor, and owner of Leduc Entertainment. I have chosen a life off the beaten path and wanted to find others that are doing the same. Spaghetti on the Wall is a show based on all of the years that I've thrown spaghetti on the wall and nurtured what's stuck. We will share fun stories, ideas, tips, tricks, and more. Welcome to Spaghetti on the Wall. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on when you are consuming this podcast ladies and gentlemen spaghetti on the wall back with another one john laduca i gotta tell you i i, I like you already because of the name the crowd is going wild and honestly I, I i actually changed my name so i could be part of your podcast it was something else it's smith it's john smith yeah that's awesome yeah john laduca actor um, you know, sales guy, and now runs the successful company that is Playbook Builder, and we're going to get into all of that. Um, and I just, uh, d you know, what? Before we get into that, tell us how you even got to being, you know, to owning this company, and why you're an entrepreneur and visionary and all of that good stuff. Well, I think I, I'm, I grew up on the island of unwanted toys, you know, like a lot of visionaries sort of a misfit outlier, didn't know where I squared away really well. I was the guy doing homework at red lights on the way to high school. You know, just wasn't, yeah, wasn't wired for the, the normal and the, and the conventional and had no idea what I was. And um, did, some, did some sports stuff, did theater in high school and thought I was going to be really good at that and ended up kind of chasing that, was, was, was successful as, not as an actor, mostly as a director. And, you know, very serious stuff like black turtlenecks and, and smoking unfiltered cigarettes and, and, and doing this a lot. Did you, was it clove? Was oh, it my God. Oh, no, God, no, no, no. <laughs> but no, that's funny. Um, that's the right era, though, right? Uh, I, I just love the idea of swimming around in ideas and, and the performance aspect is really cool. And so much of that ends up translating really elegantly into what I did as a career. Uh, I ended up going up to the Bay Area to go to school and study and dropped out to start a dot com, which had absolutely nothing to do with what I do today, but it was just the sort of following my nose. It was 1993, and everybody was doing that. You know, it's just sort of like, well, of course, you know, it's, it's what you do in this part of the world. Everyone's doing this. So I was, uh, I, was I had a part-time job um, working, writing, learning how to write code and writing code for a guy who had bought a little company called Dine One One. And if you grew up out in San Francisco, remember Dine One One, if you had a condo or an apartment, there'd be these magazines in the lobby and you could flip through them and find the restaurant that you wanted and you could order food and it would be a call center and then they'd get a driver and they'd ship it to you. So this dude came from China with a ton of money and he was going to digitize that. It was basically like Grubhub. And uh, I was working with him and I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to peel this thing out. I'm going to go start my own thing and build what was at the time, which is really funny because it sounds super cool. It wasn't at all cool. I just want to make sure everybody's clear. Uh, it was the first entertainment web portal for the city of San Francisco. So it was restaurant, club, cafe, and bar listings and, and menus and stuff like that. And it was just me and a buddy. We wanted to meet girls. And we got on club listings. And we wrote reviews of restaurants and clubs as a draw. And then we went and we sold advertising, like put their menus on. You know, just it's a basic idea. Like Yelp. Totally, but it was 1993, and it was like HTML, and we were creating this thing. And we were right, and we were first. 
we were idiots. We had no idea what we were doing. We had no money. It wasn't really a business. It was just a like a like a a lark. It was a hobby. It was a heist. And these big kids came and just wiped us off the face of the earth. They obviously knew what they were doing, saw the market opportunity, and we were gone. And it was so cool. I mean, it was sad. I think, you know, we, we just walked with basically, you know, beer money. But um, I had no idea what I was. And that was the first foray. I was like, I'm good at a lot of the th weird things that make this kind of um, initiative work. And... I would never have called myself an entrepreneur. I don't think people were really doing that so much back then. It was, you know, not necessarily the terminology people were assigning. Like, I'm an entrepreneur. I was just a guy with a corny idea and thought I could wing it, wing it and figure it out along the way. And um, I learned a really good lesson, and that is if you have a shitty idea, you have all the time in the world. <laughs> Take your time. But, you know, you bump into something valuable and you better be ready to execute. And we weren't, so we got, you know, we got what, what Mother Nature doles out. And that's fine. I went out to Ann Arbor, of all places, and got a job as a sales guy for a little dot-com. I was, like, employee number 12 or 13, I think. And within 18 months, we were 120 people. And Check Free bought us for a quarter of a billion dollars. And it was a magnificent culture. It was an incredible place to work. We were going like a rocket. And in there, all weird hours, sales reps were in California. We were doing conference calls, no Zoom, of course. It's like 1997. And uh, when Check Free bought us, it kind of went corporate. Everybody vested and bailed. And the market fell apart like, oh, golly, I think it was about six months later, the, you know, the bubble burst. I'd gotten married, moved to Chicago. And because of the experience I had, this company was called Bluegill, Bluegill Technologies. And um, because of that experience, I wanted to do something that had occurred to me working there, and that was the people that ran that place had this incredible culture they'd created. They had all this, this connection to a kind of a wisdom. They were sharing values and principles, but they were providing some freedom, uh, but a framework within to operate. So you couldn't get too astride of their, um, their parameters, but they were encouraging an innovative kind of dot-com startup dynamic. So we moved really fast, but people weren't going and breaking the law or doing things out of bounds. This is amazing cultural dynamic and I thought this is some cool stuff and in 2002 so now I'm in Chicago and I build a business that is an intellectual capital development firm and my job was the best job I've ever heard of and it was the most fun I, I could fathom having my job was to go in and help really successful entrepreneurs know why they were successful so they could scale what they were doing so instead of being the consultant with all the answers, I wasn't smart enough for that. I'm still not smart enough for that. I just would go in and ask them questions, like a good podcast host. I was just like, so tell me about you, and then I'd be egoless and small and just listen and just allow the person to just expound and expand and share and do whatever. And then I'd ask them in areas and compartments of their world how they thought about things and how they did things. And what I found was the top 1% are very intentional, very uh, fastidious, in fact, with the small things they attend to. It's not by accident that they've gotten to be where they're at. And my job was to sort of map those into predictive models. So you could basically say, when we put Armando in the room, he's going to go left instead of right. He's going to zig instead of zag. We can kind of deconstruct how you're thinking so that it covers a lot of areas in the business. And then we could actually take a discrete set of activities, like how you run a podcast or how you would do a sales call, and we could scale that. We could break it down in such a fashion that it could be something that a junior could come in and get within striking distance. And when these guys kind of reached the peak of their business model, they'd reached sort of the vertical limit of it. There was no place to go other than scaling their intellectual property. Like there wasn't any more hours in their day. They'd reached sort of the limit of that. Um, I'd gotten on uh, to a, a connection with a fellow named Dan Taylor. Dan was a coach at Strategic Coach. Dan... I don't know, I got lucky, Dan just liked me, and I didn't deserve it, but he just liked me, and fed me books to read, and decided to mentor me, and in uh, 2006 or seven, introduced me to one of his clients, his name was John DeMonda. DeMonda was running the Northeast for t uh, Lincoln Financial. He had like 175 reps under him, and I charged nothing, because I was just like, oh, this is great, this is a great opportunity. So I just charged him a little bit of money, so he'd say yes, and I got in there, and I 
I figured out what John was doing and we gave it back to John as an operating system and 175 reps got better and John DeMonda was tapped to run all of Lincoln Financial and overnight I was like the new sexy in the wealth management and insurance industry. So of course go back to me growing up in San Diego like any of my friends like if they knew that I was like the guy in insurance helping insurance professionals they would have peed their pants like I couldn't spell insurance like I had no idea what these people were doing. I just wasn't charged with helping broken. I was in there to like capture genius. They were already winning. They didn't need me to fix them. They just needed to figure out why the hell they were winning. They had sort of normalized it. Like you've been doing something for 25 years and it becomes what you'd call common sense. And of course it isn't. You've just turned it into something that seems so natural. You can't fathom why somebody else can't do it. My job was to be like a journalist, just to go in there ignorant as hell and go, I don't understand why you do it that way and, and get them to share. Well, when we got John DeMonda as a client, I started to pick up a bunch of strategic coach clients and then Sullivan, Dan Sullivan, elected to make uh, my company the go-to for strategic coach clients to do process. And it was a big deal. It was a big privilege and it was terrifying because the standards are super high and you'd go viral either way. You'd get you know kicked out or you could go nuts in there. We went nuts in there and it was a blast. I worked with the Zigglers and we worked with Fortune 100 CEOs and I worked with literally hundreds, hundreds and hundreds, close to 500 of the top one percenters. And uh, they were different industries, they were doing different things, and I was always just the ignorant guy going, so tell me, like a podcast interviewer, like, you don't know where I'm gonna zig and zag, you're just treading along with me, listening intently, and waiting to see if there's themes or things you can hop in on. I was doing the same thing, it was a blast. And I got to listen to really smart people talk about their business models and their dreams and how they troubleshoot and how they hire and fire. And because of the latitude, the, 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 the breadth of industries, I started to see patterns. And we just had a shit ton of fun with it. It was an absolute joy and a privilege to help these men and women. And they were fabulous. They were good people. And they were rocking business people. They were pioneering and innovative. Well, I'm writing stuff down when they talk. Right? It's, I'm like Gen X, knucklehead. I'm like, oh, that was Armando. That was so incredible. So can you say that one part again? You know, like, like I'm writing stuff down. We decide to film them, and it's the impetus for Playbook Builder. So, like, that was 2007 or 8. 2009, we'd stood up a prototype, and son of a bitch, the first guy to really exploit the platform was John Enright. He was so good in his space, he could license what he was doing to his competitors. He made seven figures as a side hustle teaching his former competitors what he was doing. Uh-huh. I mean, unbelievable. These guys were just so incredible. And I got to just, you know, I was like the, you know, the pool boy. I mean, I wasn't like important or providing them with leadership. I was just asking questions, antagonizing some clarity and picking up what they were putting down. Ended up building like a, a, an agency model. So we had a creative agency and I built the software company and we slapped the two together with a bridge of consulting and we were identifying and packaging and helping these guys monetize their wisdom. And I can't actually think of something more fun to be doing. It was just so much fun. We are on the razor's edge of somewhere between the creative and the emotional and all their ideas in their head and all this woo-woo crap and then the absolute practicalities of does that dog hunt? Does this drive top line? Does this thing reduce waste and inefficiency in the, in the business? And we got into some big organizations. We got into startups. We saw the, I got to see the whole bloody thing. And because Sullivan's company was feeding us clients, you know, I, I atrophied my sales and marketing skills because I didn't have to do that stuff. On the other hand, we just did reps. I mean, I don't know anybody that's done as much as I have in terms of just over and over. I mean, people would show up with the work that we did at a workshop. If you've done strategic coaching, know about it. You know, you're sitting at tables with your peers and literally people would be like, I heard I'm supposed to hire you. I don't know how much it costs. I was told it doesn't matter. And I've got somebody else to talk to. And they'd freaking pass the phone around and we'd end up with, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. I got to a place where I was 20,000 bucks for a day and um, just advice, not even doing the work. I would build a proposal. I'd charge them 20 grand to come in and identify what was going on and build a game plan together, put a proposal together at the end of that meeting. So 20 grand to build a proposal and then we'd run with them like a, like a fractional team, harvesting IP, packaging their curriculum and tools and then launching these things as ventures. It was super, super cool. And so when I met you, obviously, we had lots to talk about because intersecting those two lines of that creative sphere, like theater seems so lame. Like, 
can't imagine I was doing that stuff. I wasn't in tights or anything, but it was still lame. But on the other hand, I learned how to listen. I understood motive. I understood the ideas of language and how they can create connections for other people. I learned a lot that actually ended up applying to the work that I do. And, and you know, you, you and I share kind of that creative background, but then you bring it into practicalities of working with small business and it's a nice dynamic. It's a nice combination. You can't just run these things, you know, it's not a calculation. There's so much more on the table than that. And uh, yeah, that's how we became friends. That's just talking about what a bunch of weirdos we are and how like marvelous that is and how much fun we get to have doing what we do. But that's my background and story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> that's the story. There's a few, I was in jail a few times, I'm just kidding. But uh, no, that's about it, that's it, that's it. I got married along the way, I have three great kids and a beautiful wife. And I don't know why, but she stayed with me for almost 25 years. And I live in the west coast of Michigan, where I never would have thought. I thought this was flyover country. I live in one of the coolest little communities on the west coast of Michigan. And because of my connections with EOS, I, I just get to run around with crazy entrepreneurs like you. That's, that's, been, my, um, that's been my jam. That's amazing. Does that, does that help? Incredible. Fun, right. right? That's it. Uh, you've that's got it. the same story. You've got crazy. That's good. Story. We're uh, we're 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 done with the podcast. It's just <laughs> amazing. <laughs> um, no, dude, fantastic. Look, playbook builder. Um, we've been, you know, kind of, we, we've had success just kind of doing our thing. And I I think a lot of entrepreneurs, not a lot, but there's entrepreneurs out there that. Um, that don't know EOS, that are just kind of operating their business, and they're successful, but they're like they're, they're, they they've hit a ceiling. They know that they need something else. They know that they have to bring operations into their business. You know, they can't necessarily step out of the CEO seat. You know, and you you have the privileges of work, the privilege of working with like the one percenters, right? That already know that they're the visionary and that they want to let go. You know, they did want to let go. You know, um, I work with a lot of attorneys that are like still wanting to hold on to like being an attorney and then also, you know, being the, the CEO and visionary of their business. And I'm like, guys, it, you can't do both. Well, like, I've like seen you your model both. and what you do for a company is what actually Sullivan called a, a value creation monopoly. And I love that you think in these terms and it's so evident, like you so understand them. When I saw what you were proposing, and what you offer to your clients, I was like, this is a smart guy. Because you just know how limited the capability set is to have one single asset, not know what to do with it. Or just have one aspect of an asset and not have the whole thing. Like, you just probably started giving that thing and just stood on the sidelines. Like, I did the same thing. I'd sit on the sidelines and go, great, right? You know what to do with that, right? And nope. And we go, well, maybe we'll do that for you. And then we go, holy crap, we have to become basically like a, an embedded resource. And I saw that you did that. And I thought, this, and I don't mean reeks in a bad way, this reeks of a guy who has been listening, cares deeply about outcomes, not just staying in your little lane, not just yeah. doing what you're paid to do. Like, you were over the line and then decided to get paid for it. But if you're working with those small businesses, I did too. And until they let go and really accept who they are, you know, they, they hang on to weird stuff. But, but having someone like you come in and do what you're doing and just basically be the friend they never had, somebody that's thinking critically on their behalf, like it's an indispensable value. They just don't find people like, vendors don't do that. Vendors are standing on the side of the pool going, well, I gave you a life preserver, what's your problem? You know, and, and that brings us to the conversation we were having right before we started recording, right? Yeah, yeah, you were yeah, like, yeah, hey, yeah, Armando, yeah. what, you know, what, yeah. what's going on with you? And I'm yeah. like, well, I just, you know, my world got rocked. I, you know, I, I visited, I, we're a member of, of this organization called the Visionary, Visionary Forum. And twice a year they do this summit where they bring these visionaries from across the country to a place. And we connect and, and they bring these speakers in. And the speaker came in to talk about like, you know, just energy and stuff like that. And I'm not the guy, I'm not that guy, right? I'm, I'm logical. Yeah. I'm like, you know, if it's, if it's paper, I need to feel it, right? You talk, you start talking to me about like metaphysical and energy All work and I'm like, and, stuff, and yeah. you, and you lose me, right? But, but I was like, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, let me just open, right? I'm just gonna That's keep cool. my mind open. And I started asking questions and, and, um, and this 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 lady Lisa Young, right, who's a medical doctor turned speaker, and her first her first sp keynote was a TED talk, right? Like that's how crazy this is. And she's like, Armando, you you are living um, unauthentically, 
Like, that's the problem. Like, and I was like, what are you talking about? She's like, you know, because of the trauma. And we started talking about, you know, how I was raised. And you were talking about, like, the visionary and, and how we grow up. And, and we're yeah. made to feel like we're, Ar Armando, calm down. Uh, take it. Take it down. Like, what do you mean, <laughs> calm down? You know what I mean? Like, and always putting a lid on me, right? And calling me stupid. And I had shame because, like, I was make I had a 1.8 grade, grade point average, right? And I'm, like, being compared to my, you know, associates here. And, um, and like, I just li lived a life where it was, like, always Armando's fault. It was always, mm -hmm. I was always at fault for something. And then so I turned into a bad kid, right, because I had all of this energy and no place to put it, right? And so what happened was I became an actor because I felt like for the first time I could, like, be somebody in this character, but it wasn't Armando, right? Mm -hmm. And so now I'm not being judged on me. I'm just being judged on the character. So I was like, yeah, cool. That's great. And for years, I lived that way. And for years, I, would, I felt like I would have to Trojan horse my way into relationships because I didn't feel like I was worthy of, of myself, right, and of my offers. And so what I was doing... What I was doing as a result was, you know, living in this imposter syndrome, being this actor, be like, and just like doing things as a defense mechanism, right? And forcing things. And like, I would go 120 miles an hour and I was just like forcing my way to do everything, right? And she's like, Armando, why don't you take a step back, slow down a second, right? And like, you know, maybe tap into to something bigger, right? And tapping into the infinite and god or un the universe and you know and step out of ego right and like understand that there there's things out there like how do you know that where you're going right now is where you even want to go that's right like just because you want to just because you're saying it doesn't mean that and you're not leave, leaving yourself open enough to like get that and i was like what the, what are you saying you know what i mean and so like my meditation and so i meditated for the first time that night in a way where I was like connecting with the infinite, connecting with God. And I was just like, you know, I'm just going to stay open. I'm just going to slow down. I'm not going to go 120 miles an hour. You know what I mean? Like, give me, give me guidance. I'm letting go. I want to get in the flow. I don't want to force things. I want to be in flow. I want to be in flow. And all of a sudden, like things start happening like, and fast, right? Faster than I could have ever imagined it had I like wanted to force it. Like I had Gino Wickman on last week and he just yeah. came out with his book Shine Yeah, this week that is talking about this, right? Like this in particular, like, and how to shed all of the crap that we have so that we can live our true authentic self, yeah. right? And, and man, like my vision four years ago for my business was, I am going to help 500 entrepreneurs reach seven figures so that they can free up their time. It's just words on paper, right? I don't even believe it. How am I going to let my, my employees believe it, oh, right? Yeah. And I get back, and I'm like, the vision. So what's the through line? What, what have I actually helped people with? You know, and I've helped people, like, unleash their voices, right? Visionaries mm -hmm. and CEOs, like, get past their imposter syndrome through the act of creating content. Great. And then they started believing in themselves. And I was like, damn. That's what my vision is like. My vision is to, to go out there and help entrepreneurs and visionaries unleash and amplify their voices so that they can actually go out there and, and, and impact the world, not just like make money, right? And I'm like so money focused for the longest time. And now I'm like, no, let's, let's connect, yeah. right? Like my sales calls now are connection calls. Yeah. Are we even a good fit? Like I don't need your money. I'll, I want the connection. Are we a good fit here? I'm telling you, man, like... I'm on a whole different, I'm in like in the infancy stage of this whole thing, but like I'm, 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 I'm a believer. I've crossed over the threshold. I'm all about it. You know, I, I, I absolutely believe that there's a high vibration that, that we're putting out. Um, do you know the Tacoma Narrows Bridge? Have you heard of that? So uh, they built a bridge in Tacoma, Washington in the 50s, I believe. And they built it. And they didn't realize that the wind was going to create um, a vibration. Yeah. And this thing was like waving steel and concrete and it's waving like this. And it hit the resonant frequency. And that's why, like, you know, if you pick up a glass and an opera yeah. singer can like sing and it shatters, everything has a resonant frequency. Like we know this. So I was like, if that's the if that's true, then we, too, have a resonant frequency. Right. Like we, too, are like this balls of energy. And I'm like. 
damn, that's powerful. Why am I like not tapping? Why haven't I been tapping into the infinite and just letting go? It's such a, uh, it's just a more beautiful way of like living. And so um, I've just been kind of slowing down and stepping back and, and just kind of letting things happen and, and, and going at it going at things from a different perspective and more from a connection perspective. And here's what's cool about what you're getting awesome. at. Here's what's really beautiful about it is, isn't it, isn't it amazing that the connection between this unleashing and this power was about you letting go? Right. It's like the universe has gravity. It wants you to do what you're built to do. It's you that fucks it up. Yeah. You and your fear and your stuff and your worry and whatever the crap is in your head. Like, isn't it funny that, like, it's just kind of saying, like, all right, whatever. I'm in. Whatever the hell that means. And then it goes, oh, God, I got a place for you. Let's go. And it's sort of waiting for you to just get out of your own bloody way. Most of the clients that I had over the years would gain the world and lose their soul. You've heard that experience, you know, that expression yeah. before. And so they'd kind of come to this end of a paradigm and the paradigm was that there's some sort of base camp that they'd arrive at. Well, I climbed my ass off for 25 years. I make twice as much money as anybody in my space. And now I'm the guy and I show up to base camp and you know what? It's a bunch of vending machines, most of which are empty. Oof. The sauna doesn't actually, the jacuzzi doesn't have any water in it. Like this is bull Like there's absolutely nothing up here. And the paradigm is actually harder to swallow, but it's real, which is no, it's beautiful. You just have to be a climber. You just have to keep going. You just have to accept the fact that you're still becoming and just kind of fall into that and stop thinking about this like, if I do this thing, I get a cookie. And most of the men I met, and mostly men it was about, had this complex of am I enough? Could I stop kind of trying to stretch and become and just kind of be in the world and is there a place for me? And it was about letting go like that. And it's, it is the most powerful place to be. It is the most, I think, commanding presence as a human. And I, I, I oriented it around gender, and I don't necessarily think it's explicitly that. I've met many women who had that, but they have male energy. These women had the same, you know, MO as, as, as women. So it's, it's a male energy issue. And it was just sort of like, am I enough to slay dragons? Can I? Am I big enough, brave enough, strong enough? Can I? And I think what was fascinating was they'd get to the end of the rainbow, at least for them, and realize is a fraud. There's nothing up there. And you, you could argue, you could say, oh, you could still climb. You could still probably see the ideal of base camp that was you would put out there for yourself. You could still be doing this, but isn't it weird? You could take the elevator by letting go. <laughs> isn't that just nuts? And then what you'd find out is as you pass base camp, you just keep going. You just keep going, flying right past that bull or whatever you thought was enough. And it ends up being like the most beautiful way to live. I mean, I want to die on my feet like most people do. I can't imagine playing shuffleboard or whatever, laying around on the beach. And it's kind of a mindset that is very timely. I don't think that you think this way if it's the 1980s. But I think in the 2020s, I think the paradigm is, you know, we are evolving into a bigger expression as people. We have the opportunity, sort of this self-actualization idea in the industrialized West. We can do that. It's hard. You got to do it. And it was a cool thing. You flipped the switch. And what I know to be the case is you'll come to another base camp and you'll have to kind of go through this again. Oh, yeah. You'll come to another one and be like, nope, <laughs> smells like the mall. This is bullshit. Here we go again. I, this isn't it. It's kind of an interesting idea. Yeah, I think I think um, my parents' generation, you know, you'd work really hard, you'd do a good job, and then you'd get to retire. And it's like a fallacy that's full of danger. Oof. Yeah, but even as a grown man your age, you hit an income target, hit a uh, top-line gross revenue number. That's base camp. Empty. And you're dabbling in a place that will fulfill you. I think forever, it's wonderful. It's such a beautiful thing. And it's so liberating to hear that the secret of your success wasn't trying harder. Right. Right. It yeah, was like, accepting like, hey, God made you. You're really great right now. And you're perfectly designed for something. Fall into it. Let it guide you instead of, you know, this kind of energy. That's very male energy. Like, I will make it happen. Yeah. And, you know, I think there's a, there's a merit and a virtue to that. 
but it can become such an obsession that I think you forget you're not alone. You're in partnership. You're co-creating. Yeah. And look, as as AI starts to come into play and, and people start to lose their jobs and people start to Dude. lose the lose the meaning, I think because people associate what they do with who they are. Right. And as they Operate. stop. Yeah. And as they stop being that, you're going to have a bunch of these existential crises happening yeah. where people are like, what's who am I? What am I going to do? You know, and then depression starts, you know, and, and they. Yeah. Man, it's just, but if they, if you're listening, <laughs> if you're listening, like there's, there's, there's a whole energy out there. If we can just like, let go. She was talking about like a hose, right? And so if you crank, right. crank the hose, right? There's, there's no water, but if you let go, that's right. then, then there's the water. Right. And so right. how do we get into that flow state and how do we allow those things to happen? And it's going to happen if you get off your phone, if you are right. present, if you're, you know, if you give yourself the time to like really listen to yourself that day that I meditated for the first time where yeah. I felt like I actually meditated for yeah. the first time, yeah. Yeah. I heard a voice that was like, Hey, finally. Yeah. And I was like, shut what, what, what oh, are you saying? I love that. It was oh, like, Oh, that. Oh, Hey, what's That's up, cool. man? Like, let's have a conversation. It was yeah. like, and it was a scary, it was a little scary at first, like at first. Cause I was like, cause like things are, you know, you can, I could feel like the, these walls coming down. Like I like felt things. Right. And now, now when I'm going through stuff, I'm like, cause I'm always like, ah, this is a game changer to my, to my sister. Who's my project manager. Right. And she works for me and she's always like, you're always on that game changing thing. And I said it today, but I was like, you know, I used to say it, but now I believe it. You know what I mean? Like I feel it this time instead of it just being like a flavor a of the thing, month, yeah. you know, or like a tactic. Yeah. Before it was a tactic. Now it's a belief. Now it's a it's coming from a different place. That's pretty you know? neat. That's yeah. pretty neat. How neat to catch you at this intersection. <clears throat> yeah, I've been <laughs> I've been talking. I was at a poker game last night, <laughs> and, a, and a friend of mine. You know, he's just like he's angry. You know what I mean? Just super angry, like complaining. And I was like, I was like, John, man, what's going on, bro? Oh, and it was this and that and you know, just complaining about politics and complaining about this. And I was like, I was like, I was like, Hey man, it's, a, it's okay. Like, it's all right. Like you got to let that stuff go. Like you're, you know, I, and I don't want to get into what, what I'm doing, but like you're vibrating at a, at a low frequency. But what are you saying? I was yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, there's, there's vibrations, man. Like you got to get out of it. You got to tap into something more than, than yourself. And, and we had this conversation. You can like, you could see like he was getting lighter, you know? And I was like, all right, cool. Well, this is, this is what it's about, right? Let's have deeper conversations. There's a movie I bet you'd enjoy if you haven't seen it. And for all your listeners who are tuning in to what you're talking about, it's a really cool movie that parallels the in biology, the actual biochemistry of what you're talking about with interviews with some of the leading uh, quantum mechanics experts. It's called What the Bleep Do We Know? Do we know, yeah. I haven't seen, seen it in a while. I need to see it again. It's fabulous. This it idea again. that we become addicted to these peptides, you know, like we get a, 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 a spike of good drugs in our brain for um, following certain thinking patterns is a really dangerous trap. But mm. um, what you're talking about, that pattern interrupt for your buddy reminded me of it. But um, yeah, you, I, I thought if you haven't seen it, because it's old. If yeah, you, yeah, it's old, but I, I, I need to revisit it. It's super now, cool, though. It's really now really, with this perspective. Yeah, yeah that's what I was yeah. thinking. Is like yeah. this idea of quantum mechanics that you are in fact really creating the fabric of the world around you. I mean, or even just on your own biochemical level, like we're mostly water, and you can think shapes into water. You've seen that. There's a Japanese um, scientist who does these experiments with water. And they address this in the, in, the, in the movie, and they show examples of water crystals with an intention placed on the water crystals. And so you imagine just what you're comprised of, how powerful your mind is. You talked about the fact that we're in electrical charge and how you vibe, quite literally, your vibrational frequency can inform the actual biochemical re reactions in your body. You're literally in charge of tuning up this machinery yeah. And can grow addicted to the things that make you feel bad or lust or whatever the thing is, you know, that gets you rage, whatever depression, you can become addicted to it or you can actually reframe it and then kind of think your way out of it in a way and retrain the body and retrain those those dopamine responses. 
I thought that was so freaking liberating. The yeah. idea that in addition to being in charge of my response, you know, I was an entrepreneur, right? Which meant plenty of panic attacks, three o'clock in the morning, oh my sweet baby Jesus, what am I doing moments, right? And I just remember like getting on my hands and knees and begging God for wisdom, which is fine. I named my company the Wisdom Link. That was the first company I built. And I just asked for wisdom. I was just like, just help me figure this shit out. And I'm supposed to be used, like, I'm not sure how, but for, for the love of God, just like put me in play. And at some point I remember on dark, dark times, listening and writing down some of the voices in my head, like the kinds of things I was saying to myself. And I was like, who in the hell would talk to me like that? And one of the breakthroughs for me was to realize that that wasn't actually me. It sounded like me. It was my voice. It, it sounded like, if you heard me on the phone, like, it sounded like my voice. I was hearing it in my head, but I never questioned, like, the origin of it. And I had to kind of go, like, oh, easy. And when I separated that, I realized there's, a, there's an egoic part of me that can separate from that aspect and actually take dominion, kind of, kind of go superior, and slow that down and think differently. Just because it's in my head, I don't have to just subscribe to that if it's a fear or a danger or whatever it would be. And I started really listening, and that is a meditation just to listen to head chatter. And it, when you separate the two, when, the, when you actually create distance between them, you feel, it was for me at least, an incredible feeling of being in command, managing. And I'd always yeah. thought, well, I thought it. I suppose it's supposed to be true. I mean, I thought it, it's my thought. I'm gonna live authentically. So if I'm afraid of that, I'm gonna accept that I must be afraid of that. And I was like, fuck that, I'm not doing that. What if I decided to just decided, that's actually the powerful word, I decided not to. And that was really kind of pivotal for me. And I think that this self-awareness stuff, nobody talks much about this. I mean, they do, I, I suppose. It's just not really um, addressed enough. But the lonely entrepreneur thing and the, 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 the kind of mental health challenges. It's why like entrepreneurs are such badasses when they figure it out. Cause you have to do lots and lots of really hard work in yep. here. Yep. You just can't, I think, sh I mean, you sure, I suppose you you know, your dad can set you up in business or, you know, and be an idiot. But for the self-made first generation entrepreneur just goes out in the wilderness and figures something out. You either become a crackpot and you're underneath the desk somewhere, you know, shivering and quaking with fear, or you become a badass. I remember the book, Total Ownership. Did you read that? No, I need to read it. You dig it. It's our Navy SEAL, and he's talking about that mental landscape. Like, you own it when you're an entrepreneur. You're responsible for everything, which can be really hard. You're saying yes to your inner journey or kind of taking ownership and dominion, and I like that you did it through meditation, but that voice, you know, that's a great friend, right? That voice was definitely on your team. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I like that you're in this space. How fun for you. It's like a big deal. You're it's right. A big, it's a very I'm big never deal. Never going back to here. How has it informed work? Has it changed the work you do? Oh, 100%. Tell me about that. Or just the way you're showing up at work or actually the work you're doing. So now, like, so our, our process is, you know, development, pre-production, production, post, and then distribution okay. in terms of, like, how we do it how we do it right we I show up that. and we and we yeah. shoot the shoot the content the development aspect was like always secondary like it was just like sort of this afterthought we were just like let's go and create content now it's like it's all about the development it's all about like the the, the beginning stages right and now i'm like hey john we're going to create content for you, but we're not just going to create content. Like, what is your one thing? Yes. What yes. do you love? What's yes. passionate? Great. You know, yeah. and that thing, when, when they, when they tap into that, you can, their eyes yeah. open up. There's yeah. they, they change. And I'm like, that's what we talk about. And now everything, when we're talking about branding and when we're talking about like creating content, everything is done through the lens of that one thing. Oh man, I love this. This is so smart because yeah. you get somebody speaking about what they're really passionate about. They can be talking about anything and they're effective. Yeah. Ask yeah. them to say the company mission statement and they're not the guy who wrote it. And it's like, oh my God, can we just not do that ever again? It's horrible. Yes. I love that you're doing this. So you're basically doing what you're done, what you've done for yourself. You are unleashing and basically validating like you, whatever is powerful and important to you needs to be said. You need yeah. to bring that light out into the world, which they need permission to do and probably love you for doing it. Yeah. yeah I, 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 everybody. So exciting. I got to make an Thank introduction. You. I'm going to make an introduction. I got a guy. 
I got a guy. He's in the West Coast of Michigan. I'm going to introduce you to him, and he's a perfect. Fit. He's a perfect fit because, like we were talking about, entrepreneurs kind of they come either they get crazier and further out a field or better or whatever, or they figure this stuff out and they become like these really powerful, self-actualized people. He's picked yeah. the, he's picked the latter path, and it's really neat. And he's got a voice, and I think he trusts it, and he he's. He's ready, I think, for the platform, and I think he should know you now. But it's, he's ready, really, which Very cool. is part of it. I, I mean, when you assign that language or help them to, tell me about that experience for them. Like, what's that like for them to s finally assign some language to that? Groundbreaking. So I, have a, yeah. so I have a client in Fort Lauderdale. Um, they do work injury rights. Right. And there are three attorneys. Okay. Two are married. The other one's just a, a partner. Okay. And we've been creating content for them on for months, like eight months. Okay. And like when I'm asking them about work injury, it's like, <laughs> like you can just see they're gone. It's right? like, thing, like why it? are we here? Yeah. Oh you know? God. And so I start talking to the Stacy, who, who's the, who's a lady. And I'm like, let's have a conversation. Right. Cause like, I want to build your personal brand because nowadays, in terms of like social media and how people view you as we go to 2025, 2026, everybody's going to have a social currency, right? Like how do, how are you valued in terms of your digital footprint on social media, in terms of how, how many followers you have, you know, and like what we want to do is like, I want to build your personal brand and then that in turn will grow your business. That's right. But on automatically. That's right. Um, so we need to talk about your one thing. And so we start digging and digging and digging. Well, tell me stories. And I said, I said, can you tell me like a, a, a story of like an event where you like overcame something and then from then on, like life was different? Well, yeah, I, I mean, I'm a cancer survivor. And I was like, oh, okay, go. let's, let's go. You know, yep. well, you know, I, you know, um, all of the doctors said that it was just hormonal because I had just had a baby. And like, I took it upon myself to like do my own research and she self-diagnosed, found out it was this rare cancer. And then she ended up going to New York and, and she so downplayed it. Like she's so like, I like whatever, like not a story yeah. worth telling. Okay. And I said, Stacy, this is, this is the story, right? Cause everything that you, this, you had your first kid at the time, yeah. right? Like this changed your life. So everything you talk about it's from boring. that point on is that perspective. Yep. Why you should trust your instincts. Don't listen to everybody. This is great. Right? Like those are the things. And now, now it's like now we have a podcast and that we create for you. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about trusting your intuition. We're talking about how, you know, uh, how to uh, overcome adversity, right? And now when your when your clients come and then they see your podcast, you're talking about overcoming this stuff. These guys may have lost an arm at a work at work, right? And so now you're talking about stuff that's not like, well, if you want to get compensated, you're going to want to make sure that you took pictures and shit. You know, like it's like no, like we're actually talking about like some deeper shit. And it's stuff that you want to talk about. And she's like, Armando, who needs another cancer survivor book? And I was like, stop with the imposter syndrome. Like, that's just the imposter syndrome. There's how many personal injury attorneys out there? Does it mean that people don't need a, a, a personal injury attorney? Like, yes, people need to hear your story. And look, even if one person hears this story and like, survives cancer as a result of just going back and like maybe doing some more research and getting a second opinion. Don't you think that's worth it? Don't you think that that's a life well lived? And she's like, yeah, I, I like that. And so, and you can tell like, yeah. now she wants to get on a conversation. Now she wants to do things. Now it's like, I can't wait for the shoot. And it's just like, and so all of my clients, I'm putting them through this process now. And they're like, beautiful. it's, it, it is different. Right. And I was, yeah, and I told her, do you know Brene Brown? <laughs> yeah. So, I, I, and I told her the story of, a, of, of how powerful a clip of video could be, right? right? So she talks about when she goes home at night, she has a conversation with her husband to, to let him know where she is on a scale of one to 10. And he does the same, right? So before they see each other, it's like, dude, I had a bad day. I'm at about a two, right? And he's like, yeah, me too. I'm about a two, three. So when they get home, they know that they can give each other grace, right? Okay. Or if they're at, one's at a 10, one's at a two, then he can, all right, I'm at a 10, I'll, I'll take over. And so, you know, and so I started doing with that with my wife, you know, and it's like, we don't do it all the time, but now, you know, I shared that story with her. And so now we can, 
just because that, of that video, it's like changed the relationship, right? Like there's more understanding. And so she, so now she understands like the power of a video that comes from a deeper place than just, I'm going to put some content together, you know? And so that's how, that's how it's changed. Like yeah. our company. That is beautiful. Good stuff, man. I, I think a vitalized person vitalizes. And when you are unleashing them, only good things will come from it. What we, what we saw with our clients was that their hesitancy around this was scarcity. So if they felt scarcity uh, around clients, they would conform to what they expected the client wanted from them. If they felt mm -hmm. abundance, incredible abundance, they recognized that they could be authentically themselves, fly their freak flag, and let her roll. And they would find the right clients, the suitability aspect of like, I'm gonna just lead with what my crazy shit is in my head and what I believe in, and I'll yeah. attract the people that are like, oh my God, where have you been on my life? Yeah. But it was scarcity, like if their worldview was really, like and they were in, in, in retreat in that way, they would become more commoditized. They'd play more into those conventional roles, trying to be more vanilla so they could work with everyone, and it yeah. destroyed them. It destroyed them egoically, Terrible. it destroyed yeah. them spiritually, and of course it was a sh show from a branding standpoint because they meant nothing to anyone. It was like K-Lite, the best of the 80s, 90s, beyond. It was like, oh my God, just let it rip. You're the polka channel, all polka, all the time. Let her go. Yeah. You're not going to get everybody, but you're going to get everybody you know who loves the polka in the Chicago market. And it was it was so neat to see the faith in the world and the universe or whatever being just. That there's justice in it. That when you shine really brightly and you 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 mean to do good, you mean to serve others. That you'll find the clients you're supposed to get. And what's cool about it is there's also an economic correlation there. So you hear the expression like rich get richer. I think the rich get richer because they just become like really clear at the shit they shouldn't be doing. And they get really clear where they win and they're not worried if they don't win. They go, next, because I don't need to feed myself because of this client. So if I think the guy is a creep, he's gone. Yeah. And so it's weird. It's like they amplify their successes, become more bold and strident, and that becomes like a vibration. Like you get all these radio stations blaring the same channel. You get that harmonic. I think when you get somebody who's really successful, it doesn't matter. They don't have to be a billionaire to pull this off. It's just that abiding faith that like my phone's not ringing, but the right person's going to call me because I'm true. I'm going to stay true. Yeah. And if I'm working on creating value and I kind of know who my client is, I'm going to repel the wrong ones and attract the right ones. And so it was like this transformative experience. And I'm, I'm, I'm listening to you and it's just bringing me back. And it's just, it's the best gift you can give a human being, man. Yeah. What you're doing is not just changing their business and giving them sound bites and better video quality, right? You're informing the arc for possibly a generation or two. Think of that person, look, look at her going home, the way she frames her story, the people that she's enlivening that work for her if she's lit and clear, and the alignment of clients who are coming based on her clarity. They're all gonna line right up because they're, they're paying for that person and so they're all gonna be worldview aligned. They're gonna be like, this woman who's on fire for this reason is why I'm here. And then they refer because they're gonna get fed because of what she's bringing to the table. It's the coolest. It's like an economy <laughs> because someone decided to be themselves. Like it's created yeah. right there. You get unlock someone and they start attracting the people that harmonize with that. And it's like, yeah. woo, 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 woo. it becomes yeah. this thing. When I told you I was at this little company called Bluegill in Ann Arbor, Michigan, this little dot com that, that, that got sold for all this money, they had figured that shit out. And I was absolutely fascinated with it. Like, how did you get here? How did you just decide to do this with all of the impact of trying to carry water for your investors and trying to onboard all these different people? But somehow they were just so adamant about it. They were unflinching. I got hired and we, this place was so rad. We have reunions, like a family, re like every few years people get together from Bluegill. And I was told, not confidentially, it was kind of a joke, but I did really well there and all this stuff. They told me I actually wasn't supposed to be interviewing, it was a mistake. So this great formative thing in my life, this, this ex work experience was just like was amazing accident. for me. I wasn't supposed to be there. They just liked me and thought I fit in energetically into the culture and they decided, well, his resume is the wrong resume. They, he, they sent us the wrong guy, but we're gonna keep you. 
And I just thought, that so suggested their cultural alignment that the paper with the information on it didn't matter. They didn't were like, matter. this guy's vibe works in this cultural vibe. And then when you get four or five or six or seven or 10 or 12 people all harmonic with that, it's like the Death Star. It like repels evil and it attracts more like it. It becomes its own gravitational force. Yeah, I'm sorry to get so super excited about this, but you're I playing, it. I think, with like how entrepreneurism changes the world. I really do mean that. What you're dabbling in, I think, is the alchemy of like the universe's energy expressed through commerce, where virtuous capitalism, good people trying to serve others, getting in their own way and like clearing the crap out and polishing up what they are and then unleashing them as a bright light in the world. Like you did it for you and now you're doing it for others. I think it's a watershed moment for you. The yeah. implications of the people who will cross your path from like this moment. It's so cool I got to talk with you this, this way about this time in your career. I think it's a pivot point that'll, it'll probably signal like a before and after moment for you. It feels like it. It's super, super exciting. I'm, I'm, like, like as a friend, I'm really proud of you because it's really scary and it's a really big thing to say yes to. I like that you're talking about it, baking it into your psyche and, and telling others. But I played around in that and I, I was unwittingly dabbling in it. But like an, I was a director, right? So I was looking at actors and like, what the hell is wrong with this guy on stage? He's saying the lines, but there's no life. Yeah. You've come to find out you talk with them. The actor hates the character. Right. Like that woman who's like, I hate doing this job. Yeah. There's none of her in it. So yeah. it's empty and it's just work. And everybody else feels like that too. So you go to their website and you're like, oh my God, this is awful. And then you go there and you're like, oh my God, this is awful. And then they wonder why people don't refer. They don't want to pay top fees. Why it just is empty. It's yeah, because they're no, just after the dollar, yeah. There's no life in it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I am no. pretty geeky and this is the that I love to talk about. This is like right over the target for me. That's it's awesome. that weird intersection of all those humanities and artsy classes and the realities of business, like growing top line and attracting talent. And when you get, so we do this on video, right? So we'll interview subject matter experts for Playbook Builder. And I can tell you right now, like, you know, we can ask somebody to talk about what they do and it's the worst kind of video to watch. But if you activate them, get them talking like you're doing like we kind of similarly are playing in media i'm doing it for training purposes to 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 knowledge transfer to g2 or whatever it might be but i'm creating media and we have to kind of bait them we have to get them in state yeah when you do and they're like really doing like they're showing up who they are it's really good shit it's good content it's fun to watch it's intriguing it's and you end up learning lessons along the way it's so it's it's a comparable uh, domain I play in for different purposes, but I know what you're dabbling in. It's like it's the coolest ever. And then I'm sure she's never going to be the same. She's already she's already said it. <laughs> she really she's good already for you. said it. Good yeah. for you. Yeah. yeah. Good for it's, you. It's That's, crazy. And you, I mean, the implications of that, if you trip out on it, it's quite extraordinary. Like you've got through you. The opportunity to, I think, to change, to change communities, to change families, to ha have legacy impact. You're lighting people up like a, like a really kick-ass high school teacher who changes someone's arc in their life. Yeah, you know, I hope so. I'm, you I know, do too. I, I think I'm trying hard. not to approach it from a, from an ego perspective and more from a, yeah. No, it's sacred. That's what yeah. I mean. What you're doing yeah. is sacred. What I mean is, it's like the most important work you will do. Yeah. Yeah. And the commerce aspect of it, like money will find you. So I don't think you have to worry. That kind of stuff attracts wealth, but, but you can't chase it. It's like a weird dichotomy. You can't go chase it or you won't find it, but it'll it, attract it, towards you because you're purposeful. And yeah. so what your purpose is, is this lighting of these people. And I just think there's nothing better on the planet to be up to. It's just the coolest. I really appreciate it. John, I could... I, I know this is the longest <laughs> podcast and sorry and, and and as as it should be right like I usually you know usually it's 30 minutes but like we just got on a roll and I like, couldn't stop myself I know I'm a long talker but I, I love it so excited no it was great I, I know I really appreciate it and and you know what it's so crazy like your your we didn't really in, get into like all of the nuts it's and a lousy of what podcast. Playback. I just love talking with you about this <laughs> no I love it too and I think people are going to really understand that aspect um I just 
let them know how they can find you and, you know, and how they can work with you. And I don't you know, know why they would want to after listening to me ramble like this about the quantum field. I mean, good God. Uh, you know, playbookbuilder.com is the, is the company website. Yeah. And um, honestly, like what's so cool about what we get to do is I still do professional services, not personally, but our, our company gets to do that. So sitting knee to knee and interviewing people so they can tell their story or, or, or explain why, what they're passionate about in their business, that's what we do too. But we house that content in our software. So it's an award-winning software. It's a video-based archive so you can teach process to the people on your team and tell them your stories and teach them the heritage of your place and all that kind of stuff. So that's why this slides so elegantly into what I am passionate about with Armando. Different expressions, similar craft between yeah. the two of us. But uh, I, I can't imagine any of your listeners would want this podcast in their ears just listening to us go like dogs in the backyard chasing the ball around. But you know them better than I do. Maybe this is what they're into. You guys are a bunch of weirdos. Yeah, no, that's true. If you're listening to this podcast, you're definitely a weirdo. Yeah, but, yeah uh, nice to know you. Nice to know you. You're yeah, a weirdo, too. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, I, John, I, I, man, I love what you're doing, man. I'm so proud of I you. I appreciate I'm super you. excited. Yeah, I appreciate thank you as well. I'll yeah. talk to you um, offline, but thank you, brother. Yeah. That's John LaDuca, ladies and gentlemen. And that was Spaghetti on the Wall, brought to you by LaDuca Entertainment. Soon to be a new. We're rebranding. So uh, keep listening, keep watching, and we'll see you all next week.